I am a businessman. I don't talk much, but I make a difference wherever meets the road. <laughs> Your Excellencies, heads of state and governments of ICP countries, honourable ministers, distinguished ICP captains of industries and entrepreneurs, ladies and gentlemen, I will talk on the area of industrial transformation of agriculture, including blue and green economies. And I have three recommendations which I would like to make. The industrial transformation <coughs> will take entrepreneur with vision and energy and the appetite to invest and develop critical value chains across ACP countries. For a region like Pacific, sectors to consider include agriculture, green or blue economy, also ocean, sorry, ocean or blue economy, and green economy. Potential of blue economy for the Pacific region and most ACP countries is immense and include the new, new ocean industries, which include marine aquaculture, deep, ultra deep water, oil and gas, renewable energy, offshore energy, marine and seabed mining, maritime safety and surveillance. <coughs> marine biotechnology, high-tech marine products and services through sustainability-oriented innovation system. Then greening the traditional ocean industries, shipping and maritime industries, the seafood industry, Offshore energy mine and mining industry through energy and material efficiency, ocean and water pollution control. The <clears throat> second area is the agricultural sector transformation in a context of small island countries like Pacific countries, possible role of captains of the industries. As captains of the industry, we should be able to combine in the industrial transformation and socio-economic inclusion in the agribusiness sector through, for instance, a three-stage approach. Uh, EIB is the bank of the European Union, so uh, we work with also the European Commission, with ACP countries, and I would like to uh, use this opportunity to thank very much my friend uh, Patrick Gomez for the excellent collaboration that, uh, that we have built with, uh, with the ACP Secretariat. And what we do is, we are a public bank, uh, our shareholders are the member states of Europe. Uh, what we do is we finance projects that uh, support the development of, uh, of, of ACP countries. And today, uh, Mr. President, I was, um, I was in Olkaya, uh, the biggest geothermal power plant in Africa, a uh, project that we have supported from the beginning and that we continue to support, which is expanding, a great project. We have also supported Lake Turkana, a big wind farm plant that is also uh, in a form of PPP, which is also an interesting um, and modern way of uh, developing projects. Uh, when we are in Vanuatu, we finance projects like uh, retractable um, uh, wind farms because when there are cyclones you need to be able to put down uh, the, uh, the, wind, uh, the wind park because otherwise it's going just to be destroyed. And this kind of thing that is in the family of what we do which is we try to do enabling investment. Investment that will enable investments. We do that also for the private sector. Uh, we, we, are, we don't have big teams in the field but we have partners and for example tomorrow we are going to sign a big operation with a T, a TBD bank, uh, the trade and development bank that is uh, very present in the region. Uh, this is a, a project that is going to help we can lend money to a bank that is going to lend it to SMEs and especially in this case SMEs that are targeting climate action projects. So we do a lot of these kind of projects that are trying to help uh, the people in ACP countries with grid, for example, uh, with support to, uh, uh, to alleviate a number of constraints that they, are, that they are facing. And my final point, and thanks a lot for Tony to have, uh, to have alluded to, uh, to this, 
uh, we have developed Chi Invest, and actually we are going to sign on Tuesday the first project under Chi Invest that has just been announced at the, in Johannesburg last month. Uh, this is going to be for the Uganda Development Bank, and we hope that we will be developing a lot of these Chi Invest projects because women entrepreneurship is one of the key for the growth in, in Africa and beyond. I always say to our entrepreneurs that there is no better time to be an entrepreneur in Africa or indeed in the Pacific nations than now. In my time, we were not even on the list or on the agenda of summits and events like this. Today, you have heads of state, policy, policy makers, development organizations, indeed, the entire ecosystem talking about how can we ensure that we create an enabling environment for African entrepreneurs. So, what can we really do? And I want to keep my three minutes down to three things. Three things that African entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in developing nations need to create jobs. You mentioned, my fellow panelists, that the jobs will be created from foreign investments, local or foreign, but it is the SMEs that create jobs. 97% of the jobs in Japan is created by the small and medium enterprises. So what we need is to build up SMEs. What we need is to create a strong middle class, and they will create the jobs. So entrepreneurs across the developing nations need three things. They need access to training, access to funding, and access to markets. And this is what we do at the Tony Elimilu Foundation. We, create, we created a 12-week online training program that trains entrepreneurs. And this training is something that you do not get in traditional educational systems. A lot of our traditional schools are training young people for the world of yesterday and not for the world of tomorrow. And we need to ensure that the training that the youth are receiving is training them for the world of tomorrow. 60% of the jobs that will exist in 20 years do not exist today. Technology is the key. Africa barely made the last three industrial revolutions. We cannot afford to miss the fourth industrial revolution. We must leverage technology. So I'm challenging all the heads of state here today. Let's make coding a universal language across Africa and the developing nations. Let's make every young African a coder. We can do it if we put our minds to it. Access to funding. At the Tony Olimele Foundation, we ensure that everyone who is a beneficiary receives a $5,000 seed capital because that is the minimum they need to get their foot in the door to start their entrepreneurial journey. If we only train them and we don't give them money, it's almost like giving a child ice cream and saying, don't eat it because they would not be able to prove their concept or start their entrepreneurial journey. Indeed, we do have some Tony Limil entrepreneurs in the room today. Can you stand and be recognized, please? And they have all the seeds, $5,000 seed capital. And so it is critical to ensure, thank you very much, that entrepreneurs receive the funding that they need because it is two sides of the same coin. Finally, access to markets. It is important to know that Africa suffers from fragmented markets. And I'm very thankful for the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement that has recently been signed. But signing is only the first step. We need to implement it. And to implement it, it takes hard work. It takes determination. But I'm confident with the heads of states and the, the, the in, in involvement of the private sector that we will get to where we need to. But access to markets is not just in terms of infrastructure, but in terms of connectivity. We need to connect African entrepreneurs to themselves and to the world and to ensure that everyone in Africa has access to internet so that no African is left behind. Thank you. Let me thank you for this wonderful opportunity here in Nairobi. Let me say thank you to President Kenyatta, my brother, and to all of the people of Kenya for their very, very warm hospitality extended to all of us. Um, for us, this is a a unique moment because it signals our intention to really try to claim our destiny. We have an opportunity 
that however must be premised on getting not to know about each other, but to know each other. And there's a big difference. Knowing about each other means that we are likely to continue our habits to trade north. Knowing each other means that we are likely to take down the walls and to begin to understand the values and the challenges that confront each of us and by extension to see the entrepreneurial opportunities that may be av available to build prosperity among our people. And it can't just simply be about providing jobs. It has to be also about economic enfranchisement, creating a basis for ownership among our people because that is the only way it is going to be sustainable. I listened here this afternoon and my brother Andrew Holness is here as well from Jamaica and he will tell you that for us in the region we have a slightly different problem because we have a Caribbean community that was established in 1973 that settled on a single market and single economy as an objective in 1989 but that has been constrained not as a result of the ability of governments to set the legal constructs, but effectively because we've not been able to produce enough, quick enough, in a way that allows growth to come um, more seamlessly to us. And when you start to examine the reasons, what is it, what is the oxygen that's needed? You need people, you need access to finance, you need access to training. But the fundamental issue of access to people and, and those from the Caribbean are probably tired hearing me say so, but for you here in Africa, I need to repeat it. In Suriname, we have a country with 580,000 people that is the size of the Netherlands that has 17 million people. In Guyana, which is the size of England, Scotland, and Wales, we have a country that has 800,000 people, but with a population um, that, that is nowhere near England, Scotland, and Wales of 66 million people. In Belize, it is 400,000 roughly, and it's the size of Israel at 8 million. So, and Barbados and Jamaica are a little better off in terms of the numbers, but when you compare us to a Singapore or to others in the developed world, our population numbers are still down. And part and part of the, parcel of the difficulty is that we have to find ways to manage migration more effectively in order to be able to create the dividend that you want to benefit from here as a result of the increases in your numbers of young people. Now, why is it important? Because whenever we leave here, we leave and we're going north. We're not going west, and we in the Caribbean not coming east. And, and it is a nonsense because if I told those of you who were interested in banking and finance, that we have a serious problem in the region with correspondent banking and de-risking. And the fact that ordinary members of our society are finding it difficult to even just open a bank account. Then what has happened here in Kenya with the equity bank may well now be a model to happen in CARICOM because you have been able to use the virtue of trust to broaden the base of participation and access to finance in this country in a way that the Caribbean community is crying out for rather than being hostage to a few international banks that are not responding to our domestic needs and development challenges but are responding to one-size-fits-all prescriptions that are being imposed upon it from the North Atlantic countries. If I told you that the Prime Minister of Jamaica and myself are looking for investment in tourism and for people to be able to participate in the ownership of hotels, even if you don't have the brands, then you may more willingly look at opportunities in the Caribbean community than you have hitherto done. If I tell you that we have an international business platform that acts as a hub for you to be able to engage in and with the rest of the world and that it is anchored by double taxation agreements and bilateral investment treaties that protect your investment, you may wonder why haven't you been before? So that these things are critical if we are going to move the pace and depth of business opportunities within the South among Africa, Caribbean and Pacific countries. Regrettably, we have made this a government project only. And I say so 
conscious that this is not for me about government or the private sector because I am a strong and firm believer that the state has to be an entrepreneur in our part of the world. Because unless the state opens up certain activities where the private sector is extremely risk averse, it will not happen. And unless the state takes on risk, particularly in research and development, it will not happen. So what are the other opportunities? We are in a climate crisis. You here in Kenya have felt it this week with your floods. And I offer our sympathy to those families who have been dislocated or who have lost members as a result of the floods. But we live it every day now. And we just finished less than a week ago our hurricane season. But what is the news? We are six and a half months away from the next hurricane season. That is now our continued reality. Our ancestors, our grandparents and great-grandparents did not have the luxury of getting ready. They had to be ready and be resilient. As a result, there are opportunities in the blue economy, the green economy, changing how we build houses, changing how we respond to restructuring our economy and moving away from a heavily driven fossil fuel um, economy to one that depends more on our natural attributes, be it the sun, be it the um, water, be it the wind. And why are we moving and looking north for investment when we ought to be looking at each other to better mobilize the domestic liquidity that we have in each other's country, invest in each other's country to diversify our investments so that we're not exposed only to our own peculiar challenges as nation states. We need, therefore, to see a level of transatlantic investment and trans-Pacific investment within the ACP to help us move from fossil fuel free economies to one where we have greater control and to allow for renewable energy as well as conversion of our transport sector. What is our reality? That we are being told that if we want to move to electric cars we have to wait in the line because the car manufacturers are going to satisfy the needs in Europe first and North America before they start to look at us. So where are the opportunities within Africa for the establishment of manufacturing plants that are looking to create and build the electric or hybrid cars that are needed to power the South. And who and why are we not working in a, com a cooperative manner, leveraging both capital, human, and financial from all three regions in order to build up whatever industries we are building, whether here, there, or in the Pacific. And I say so, for example, with tourism and the creative economy. The Caribbean has a mature relationship in managing tourism product. Why aren't Jamaican and Barbadian chains establishing in Africa in tourism? Why are we not equally having African, <laughs> the African agricultural diversification that Kenya has seen? Why is Kenya and other countries not leading with respect to that in the Caribbean, particularly in a country like Suriname and Guyana that have huge, and Belize, that have huge agricultural potential. And in the case of Suriname, is one of the top five freshwater sources in the entire world. So my friends, the opportunities are great, but we don't know each other. We know about each other. And the only people who can change that is ourselves. It is... It's not an easy thing because human beings tend to stick to what they know. But we need to step outside of the comfort of our familiar and to recognize that we're actually more alike than we think because we come from the same values, the same people, the same everything. It's just that we've allowed the sea and others to separate us. I believe that a few people must lead the way because success is a habit. And if the gentleman in front of me who has taken on the challenge of creating 10,000 entrepreneurs in Africa, Tony. Tony, believes that Africa should not be the limit of his horizons, and if there are others like him who can do the same, then I think that you and Chris, who I met yesterday, can be the people who help create the bridges the bridges to allow people to move and share experiences without the sharing of
knowledge and information through television and social media, and without the bridges for air and sea to move people and goods, this will be a continuous academic exercise. Thank you. Excellencies, um, my friend Chairman Tony Alamelu, all distinguished guests, it's a real pleasure to be sitting here today to speak on behalf of private sector. Besides being chairman of the local private sector, I'm also chairman of the East African Business Council, which covers six countries, which are all very time consuming, but my real day job is I am the head of IBM in regional, in, the, in this part of the world. So let me start off with, over the last three weeks, I have had a very large forum uh, with the Kenyan private sector where we met very senior government officials. That was followed a week later in Arusha, Tanzania last week, where we had 650 businesses of all sizes from six countries, very senior government officials, cabinet uh, ministers, meet to discuss business. The importance of those two conversations was that very specifically, the voice of the private sector was heard and we felt very listened to and we were very engaged. And this is really a unique part of the world where in particular the, the president of Kenya gives us great access to him and his team to talk about the issues that are here. Now I say that because when we met last week in East Africa, many of the other East African countries did not have that. But if I were to say there were three things that stood out from that meeting, both meetings actually. The first one was about competitiveness. In this region, we must increase our competitiveness because we are staring irrelevance straight in the face. Irrelevance being the rest of the market, the rest of the world is moving on and they don't really need us. So we have to stand up and take care of this uh, population dividend that we have of young people and ensure that they can rise up and be employed, gain, gainfully employed. The other really important thing is I'm starting to get the feeling that all the private sector, in the, the local private sector, is up to here. They have hired all the people that they want to hire. In fact, there is a dilemma, not even a dilemma, dichotomy, or there's a better word for that, which is people, companies, don't actually want to hire many more people than they have to. It's not their business to do that. So if the local companies aren't going to hire the people, then who is? We must make this environment attractive for people who, ha who are sitting on their capital, whether it's domestically or internationally, to come out to this region. And what's it going to take? Regulators need to get out of the way, set their mandate, get out of the way. The monetary policy I mentioned needs to remain stable. We've had a very stable shilling. Um, inflation has been very well managed. We need to ensure that when companies come here, they can get the right talent, they can invest in them, and the companies can grow. And so on and so on and so on. But basically, it's let government get out of the way. The second thing that we have to do is create a positive attitude. It's very disheartening to see as leaders in the country, and we are all leaders here, and you have to remain optimistic if you're a leader, that you are going to be able to take that to Hill. It's very disheartening to see how many people get very um, despondent about what is happening in the economy, despondent about what is possible. Because those are the very people that keep you in place and do not allow the country to move on. But that optimism will only come from trust. So we must build trust into the equation. And trust comes from integrity. Say what you're going to do and do it. And if you don't, apologize. And that means private sector needs to be trustworthy. It also means we must have faith in government. When they say they're going to do that, either side, they must do it. And we must build that culture of trust. I stand uh, this evening before you to share with you the journey of a small country in the Indian Ocean, Seychelles, looking at the next frontier of our development, and that is the blue economy. And I want to share with you concrete steps that we have taken. As you know, Seychelles has long been a champion of the blue economy, especially at the regional and international level. Our advocacy efforts have produced interesting results. Through an innovative debt swap initiative, we secured 15 million US dollars in blue bonds proceeds. 
12 million has been allocated to a blue investment fund managed by the Development Bank of Seychelles. The aim of the fund is to support sustainable fishing practices. The remaining 3 million was allocated to the Blue Grants Fund managed by Seychelles Climate Change Adaptation Trust, an NGO established in Seychelles to tackle climate change adaptation efforts. In addition, Seychelles secured a grant from the African Development Bank Fund for Africa private sector assistance for the development of our national biotechnology sector. This grant will support research work, capacity building, business development, and monitoring and evaluation for sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, I have personally introduced and launched a number of initiatives this year to strengthen our policies and improve business environment. This year, I launched a Blue Economy Council at the national level to enhance coordination amongst ministries, department agencies, and other governmental organizations with the aim of strengthening Seychelles' ocean governance mechanism. A high-level multi-stakeholder forum was also set up with participation from civil societies and the private sector. Next year, I will launch the Seychelles Blue Economy brand to highlight successful flagship initiative such as Seychelles Marine Special Planning and Blue Bonds. This will be built on national and international legal and policy frameworks. We are also looking into improving trade and commerce with our regional and other trade partners. Seychelles recently signed the AFC FTA and Tripartad FTA, and we are currently in the process of negotiating a deeper and broader entering economic partnership agreement with the European Union. We are building the momentum of our current efforts to promote blue economy, and I take this opportunity to welcome all ACP heads of state to join us in promoting our oceans, rivers, and lakes. I also extend a great welcome to regional investors to invest in our promising sector. The wholeness and myself and others are here in Africa today. Um, this is the time of the year when others at home are thinking about Christmas, and we're here. And we're here because we believe that we have to create the opportunities for investment flowing both ways and the opportunities for exchanges. But it's going to be difficult in the absence of dealing with the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is travel. And the elephant in the room is the movement of goods. Now, I was just in Ghana a month ago. We signed a cooperation agreement with the Port of Tima. And we believe that whether it is Barbados, Kingston, Nassau, that there are opportunities for hub arrangements to be able to access North America and Central and South America that are available to Africa and indeed from the Far East and Middle East coming through Africa. Now we need to make that happen working with private sector companies. Similarly, we need to deal with air travel. That, that, there, <laughs> that there is only direct travel as evidenced in the Middle Passage is the greatest scar on the 20th century of the post-independence movement of African and Caribbean leaders. And I hope that we can remove that blemish from our record. Because we are the ones now who have it within our grasp to make that travel direct rather than to be pawns of history or victims of history. Um, but to my right, you are on NBC, I'm told. And the power of television and the power of social media, and the power of technology. Kenya has been able to do what it has done with financial inclusion through technology. Now, once we start to begin to create and show that there are opportunities, then ordinary citizens are going to use the technology to reap the dividend in terms of whatever opportunities there are for business. But if we don't create the architecture and the architecture is in fact transport logistics, communication logistics, as well as protection of each other's investments. If we do that as governments to ensure fairness and equity and capacity, then our people will do the rest. The second part that I want to say is that, and we have in CARICOM to discuss how best we can do it. We thank President Kenyatta for affording CARICOM the opportunity to establish a presence in Nairobi um, with the offices that were 
handed over to us yesterday for us to outfit. And we're going to take it because we need to be able to look at how best we can access and to have a program of managed migration to get the people in the Caribbean being able to produce at a higher level. Similarly, in my own country, there's excess liquidity. Banks are paying 0.01% on savings in Barbados and in many other Caribbean countries. And in fact, Canadian banks are selling off a lot of their assets and shifting out. And the concept of de-risking has come about because they don't believe that we are large enough to matter for them to take the time to put systems in place. Now, it's, it's, it's a notion that is incomprehensible because it is telling you, as we've said continuously, that we are invisible and dispensable, not just only in terms of climate change, but also in terms of day-to-day -day functioning of access to, to finance. Now, I don't believe that we are either invisible or indispensable for Africa or for the Pacific. And therefore, we will work cooperatively because equally, pound for pound, the Caribbean has produced more Nobel laureates, more um, geniuses, more sporting athletes, more people with capacity. Well, Bob Marley and others. <laughs> the great Bob. And, and the bottom line is that we have, therefore, lessons that we can share if given the opportunity so to do. But we are in a world where our focus, regrettably, is north-driven. The instability that is now taking place in the world is driven again by the north. And we have at some point to determine whether we are prepared to claim our destiny or not. Leaders must lead, and I hope that that is what we are doing now to create the opportunities for you in the business community. <laughs> I think if there is one thing that there is, uh, I would say, a common, common dominator within the ACP is uh, the issue of climate change. So the climate change is the number one threat to humanity. It's the number one threat to our own existence. So for many years we've been talking about it. And as my sister, the Prime Minister, has rightly said, it is no longer the issue of climate change. It is a climate crisis. We're in a climate emergency. And uh, she has said that six months ago, she's just passed through the hurricane in, in the Caribbean, and she has to prepare. But other countries within, within Africa including small island states in the Indian Ocean, uh, we do not have the necessary infrastructure uh, that, were built, that was built uh, to, to, to survive, you know? And, uh, and this calls for uh, the planning, planning of, uh, of our infrastructure, how do we put in innovative infrastructure? And uh, it also requires the necessary financing. So for most of our uh, countries within the ACP, it is also for you to address the issue of mitigation here. Uh, what is more important, uh, countries who are responsible for that, they need to put the necessary funds uh, available uh, for the countries within the ACP uh, as a whole. So as we, as we speak today, uh, the urgent need is for countries that are, who have been responsible for the problems that we face as a result of climate change, they need to put the money. They need to, to put the mechanism, make the mechanism available, the financing mechanism available to help the countries. And secondly, for the blue economy, within Africa we are, we are for the first time uh, preparing uh, a continental strategy, continental, 
which I think uh, it will be ready by February next year. Uh, we will share that with the CARICOM and also the Pacific uh, Islands. Thank you. That SMEs there generate about 97% of the jobs. Unfortunately, in Africa, a lot of people look up to government as the one responsible for job creation. Um, you, are, you are speaking to leaders in the ACP. What do you, in your interaction with entrepreneurs, what do you have as the three top impediments to entrepreneurship or successful business creation in Africa? And what do you give us as, um, what would you give us as policy prescriptions? Thank you. Don't forget to mention your name and your institution. I am Solomon Jamiru, um, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Thank Sierra you. Leon. Thank you. Good evening. My okay. name is Cindy, and I'm from Village to Nation. My question is, I haven't had a lot of talk <coughs> engaging young people, especially those who live in rural areas. I'd like, to I'd like to understand how they fall in the conversation about moving Africa forward, and if there are any specific policies countries within the SCP region have for engaging them within, this, within the economy. Thank you. Please remember. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it's extremely important. Nothing exists unless you measure it. So we need to have some form of an index where we're measuring what is happening in each of our countries. I think the initiatives that Tony Lumalu are doing, I think the initiatives that IBM is doing in helping to train millions of people in technical skills and soft skills are very important. If we're going to really reap the dividend, in particular, now let me say about the diaspora, billions of dollars are coming into our countries. Most of it sort of diffuses out into infrastructure projects, which typically turn into somebody saying, I need more money because I've used it for something else besides building the apartment. I think if we could do things like create tech bonds, that means technology bonds where there are, there's more centralized, and it's probably private sector to even do it themselves, you're not more talking centralized about a Bitcoin management bond, to invest right? in. Sorry? So you're not talking about a Bitcoin bond, right? I hope. <laughs> Uh, no, I am not. <laughs> but I am talking about uh, pooling together the funds to be used in a more specific way to invest African-originated wealth into African-originated businesses, or in this context, ACP. So let's get more specific about that and put more focus on managing diaspora funds um, as a source of capital, in particular, around uh, innovation. I just want to, and I've said a lot already, on the issue of the climate crisis. Um, this is actually the area in which there's no division between Europe and the ACP. And it ought to be the platform for innovation. It ought to be the platform for greater economic returns for our businesses. Um, and we need to be able to ensure that in doing that, that we not consolidate wealth, but find innovative financial instruments that can broaden economic ownership and participation across the ACP as we make our regions more capable of surviving this unfortunate climate crisis. Within a year, we will be in a position for us to have a, a comprehensive blue economy roadmap. Pacific, Caribbean, and the African continent. Thank you. Just to echo what uh, Your Excellency, the Prime Minister of Jamaica said about the, the difficulty. <laughs> Sorry, but it does. We can exchange. The difficulty of uh, transporting goods and services from Africa to the Caribbean. But actually, it, it's much more dire than that. Ghana is an hour by flight from Nigeria. 18 months ago, there was an order from Ghana for a couple thousand metric tons of coal for a new plant. And there were tons of coal sitting in Nigeria because Nigeria is coal rich. But there was no way of getting this coal from Nigeria to Ghana. There were no ships that were willing to take this coal from Nigeria to Ghana because all the ships that come, thousands of them every month, they, 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 they offload and they go straight back to the north. And so the question is, how do we solve that problem? That is what young entrepreneurs want to know. 
Because if we cannot get our goods and services across the continent, regardless of across to the Caribbean, then how is business transacted? But whilst we're waiting to solve that problem, we can ensure that at least when it comes to connectivity, Africa is at the forefront. We've shown that it's possible. Africa leapfrogged landlines and mobile penetration is almost 80% in less than 20 years. Today, Africans lead in mobile money across the world. So it is possible if we leverage technology. So what we want to see is a situation where we are using technology to get us to where we need to get to. Today, data is king. How can we use the data that is available across all Africa, Africa countries? Can we have one platform that is the central database for all young African entrepreneurs and then leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning to create the jobs and the opportunities that we know is out there through technology. That is the challenge and I think if we look that way, we can see a lot of progress in one year. Thank you. Uh, I, I would say, considering everything that's happening in the ACP world, if I was to leave with one message is that we should celebrate success and I like what uh, Prime Minister Barbados said, which was, success breeds success. There are so many good things happening in these three geographies, but unfortunately good things are not newsworthy. Bad things are. And we must stand up and promote the successes. The successes of the SMEs, the MSMEs, and even the large companies. We must allow our small companies to become large. For some reason, I don't know why, our regulators and our anti-competitive teams say, you're getting so big, stop. Look, for the last 300 years, look what Adam Smith wrote about, which was the wealth of nations. It was about trade. It was about British East African. Why don't we have these large companies that are spanning continents and why do we cut them off so early? And in particular, we must welcome and celebrate our local entrepreneurs and not sacrifice them at the altar of international investors. We have such bright people and we must celebrate that. And let me just say one thing for the politicians and I guess last week I saw members from six countries. The best way to get elected is to get all of your people, masses of people to believe in you. The next best way to get elected is immediately you're elected, go and talk to business people and tell the business people to come and invest in your country. Then there won't be a problem talking about jobs in five or six years. So it's like a windscreen wiper. But I think the private sector really needs to be celebrated and we need to really have a positive message as leaders and keep, keep, keep that message going. And this is from the Pacific Island perspective. The, as we all know, the countries in Pacific are very small. They have a very small population base, hence a very small local market. For the small and medium enterprises to be successful, they have to look beyond their borders to export the, the produce or the product they produce. For that, they can only go to the nearby developed market, which is Australia and New Zealand. And the quality and the standard required to get in that that market is very, very high. So therefore, the, the finance requirement for the small and medium entrepreneurs in the Pacific Island is very, very important. Here, the role of development banks have to be looked at. While commercial banks, I know in some countries, they charge 15% interest on, on, on loans. The development banks are supposed to fill in the gap. But the problem is, in the Pacific, I have seen the development banks are working more like commercial banks. They are there to make a profit, not to support the, the small, or business, small or medium businesses. Therefore, I strongly suggest or recommend that the European Union should help set up a Pacific Development Bank, which, is, which should be located in the Pacific region to support 
primarily the agricultural sector, the tourism sector, the blue economy, and the green economy. We have the African Development Bank, we have the Caribbean Development Bank, but we have no Pacific Development Bank. Thank you. First, I will agree with you about uh, being, uh, being, being positive about what is going on. Every time I, I go to Africa, I am very impressed by how lively the ecosystem is, the, the enthusiasm of, of people, the fact that I agree the question in French was in particular on digital. Uh, I agree that uh, the digitalization is, is absolutely essential for uh, future growth and future employment of, uh, of, um, and, and inclusiveness also of, 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 of the economy. But my, my final point would be um, on another thing. Um, there is currently another big meeting in Madrid. Um, climate change is, uh, is extremely important. Um, we must all together do everything possible so that we can achieve the Paris Agreement. Um, some have uh, stepped aside, but I think one of the, the, the key strengths of ACP countries and, and in Europe is that uh, we are convinced that this is the way uh, to bring people better together. Thank you. Thank you, and just a round of applause for the panelists for their contribution. One quick thing. Last week on the front page of the Kenyan newspapers, they said 77% of SMEs think positively about next year. They're going to hire more, they're going to invest more. Nobody talked about it. Right. The minute something bad happened, that's all they talked about. Kenya is ranked globally out of 190 countries, number 32, in terms of entrepreneurship. Number 32, number one in the world in protecting minority investor rights. So we've got all the ingredients in terms of the people, right? But when people are saying, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know about the economy, oh, I don't know, I don't know, and I'm sure it's the same in all of your countries. We must figure out a way to change that narrative Certainly. and get out of the way and let people invest and grow their businesses. And these were SMEs, right? Certainly, something I'll be taking on.